Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state. We do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time as a regular time that we do them live. Um, and they are recorded, so if you're not able to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's perfectly fine. You can just come back later and watch all the recordings we have on our website. Um, we've got about 120, 130 now up there in our archives list. Um, we do all sorts of different things on Campus Live. We do interviews, kind of little mini training sessions, Q&As, whatever. Um, we have guest speakers that come in, and we have commission staff that do presentations. And this week we have two of our commission staff sitting next to me. Um, uh, at the end of August, some of you may know, we had a technology planning summer camp that we held here across Nebraska in four locations simultaneously across the state. Um, and we did, there was a lot of different presentations about technology and planning and sustainability and all sorts of things going on. And we've got two of our presenters here who are going to recreate their presentations from that as an Encompass Live. <laughs> um, First, there's Mary Jo Ryan, the Communications Coordinator here at the Commission, is going to talk about benchmarks, new benchmark initiatives that are coming up. Um, a intro to them, because we don't know what they are yet, yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, we'll and know what we can find out. Yeah, we'll know what we know right now. <laughs> um, and then after that, Richard Miller, our um, Library Development Director, is going to talk about um, possibility of ways that you can raise funds to maybe meet some of these benchmarks, um, sinking funds and things like that. So um, we're going to start with Mary Jo, so I will hand off to you, and you can um, control the keyboard, the mouse, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Krista. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to talk about the Public Access Technology Benchmarks Initiative. Um, I'll just go over a little bit about it, and then we'll, and please, if anywhere during this conversation you have any kinds of questions or any of you here in the room have questions or suggestions of things to point out, please let's make this a conversation. So ask your questions. As Krista said, you can type them in or you can click on your microphone and she'll know you have a microphone. Um, this is actually the Public Access Technology Benchmarks Initiative. It's a new initiative that actually has the, the potential to transform the way that public access technology is delivered and sustained in public libraries. At least that's the hope of the group that's working on this. This initiative will create national guidelines that can be used as a tool by libraries, large and small. This is an important point. To assess the quality of computer and internet services and demonstrate their value to local leaders. The Benchmarks Initiative was launched this spring by a national coalition of organizations that support public libraries with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'm just going to, if, I, if you will bear with me, I'm just going to read to you who uh, the, the different groups are that are part of this coalition. I attended a meeting this summer at the ALA conference, and they talked about this initiative, and there were representatives from all these groups. And I think it's important to you, or it could be important to you, to know who is on this group. So the coalition is... The American Library Association, Office for Information Technology Policy, Lyricis, the Public Library Association, Web Junction, OCLC, the State Libraries of California, Oklahoma, and Texas, university-based research groups from the University of Maryland and University of Washington, the International City County Management Association, and I think that's significant, mm -hmm. that we have representation from City County Management, because they see this as a way to help conceptualize through City County Management what the library of the future will look like and what they will need to supply in order to have libraries of the future in their community. And sometimes that's who the library has to convince to do these things. Exactly. <laughs> the, city, the county, the people who... Are, um, give them the money <laughs> yeah, who run their library. Who provide a good deal of the funds to, mm -hmm. to sustain and, and upgrade the public access computer technology. So um, in, additional, in addition to that, there is uh, another group, TechSoup Global, which I think probably many of you are familiar with. And Urban Libraries Council is the lead facilitator of this initiative. So um, if there aren't any questions at this point, I will just mm -hmm. go on to the next yeah, one. Speak Go. Oh, That's there she is, <laughs> in case you were wondering who's talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
um, the Public Access Technology Benchmarks Initiative. So how will benchmarks be used to support the continued growth of library public access technology? Well, clearly the public depends on Nebraska libraries for access to technology. The public depends on libraries all over the country for access to technology. And um, we've seen this in study after study, and I, I could probably read off a million of them, but I do want to read the most recent one I've looked at. This is, called, this is from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and it's called Who's in the Queue? A Demographic Analysis of Public Access Computer Users and Uses in U.S. Public Libraries. And I just wanted to tell you a couple of things from the highlights from this study. One is that public access computer users largely resemble the general public in terms of age, education, and even the overall level of home computer and internet access. So if you thought the only people who are coming into your library, you know this already, but if other people in your community think the only people that are coming into your library are people who are uh, very disadvantaged or people who don't have computers in their homes, what we know and the story we need to tell is that people are using public libraries for a lot of things, and one of the things they're using them for is public access to computers regardless of whether they have a computer in their home. Maybe the computer in their home isn't fast enough. Maybe that computer in their home, they don't know how to use it. Um, they don't know how to find what they're looking for. They've tried it at home, and it hadn't, didn't work, so they come into your libraries to get better access. The other interesting thing that came out is that public libraries are providing much more than basic technology access. Again, no surprise to you, but it might be a surprise to the people in our communities, and we might need to tell them the story of what we're doing. And um, in this particular research story study, they found that computer uses, uses of public access computers mirror the needs that people have at different stages of life. So you will find young people identifying education activities as their main use and entertainment activities. Um, people between the ages of 25 and 54 identifying employment activities as their top use. And that might be hunting for employment or it might be uh, learning something you need to know in order to continue your employment or improve your employment. And then people 55 and older, surprise, surprise, reporting health and wellness research. So, I mean, I think it's important to just have some of these facts at our fingertips when we're talking to people about our computers in our libraries because it's important that people realize that people are using these public access computers more and more every day. So, to meet this demand and maintain this vital service, technology access at libraries must be continuously improved. And we've known that forever. We've known that our libraries have to be continuously improved forever. What was the name of our planning initiative in the 80s? Continuous Library Improvement Program. I mean, we know nothing is ever over. So we are seeing, way, that, we are seeing that this could be a way to help us describe what our continuous improvement needs for public access computers. Um, but for many of us, this is a struggle. For example, according to research con conducted by ALA's Office of Information and Technology Policy, 45% of all libraries say their current internet connection speed is insufficient to meet customer demand, some or all of the time. I think all of you can relate to that. If someone needs to download a video about a surgical procedure that they're going to have, that's going to hog the bandwidth and other people are going to have trouble downloading books or whatever other things they're trying to do. And as local leaders grapple with reduced budgets, they need to understand why investments in public access technology are critical to support citizens and achieve our community goals. So, benchmarks are needed to help libraries assess quality, to help libraries provide guidance on how we can improve services, and to help demonstrate what support libraries need to maintain quality technology services for our community. If you have any questions or suggestions, just pipe up. I'm going to keep going. Um, what's the reason for these benchmarks, we might ask? Well, the goal of the initiative is to create and foster the widespread adoption of public access technology benchmarks. Their idea is then, once we have these benchmarks, we in the library field can engage local leaders, and together we can use these benchmarks to assess the quality of public access technology services and set our goals for continuous improvement. 
we can demonstrate the value of public access technology to our people in our communities in order to motivate the ongoing investment needed to maintain quality services. And I want to point out that that investment um, is something that Richard will be talking more about in a little while, but we're talking about local investment primarily because this kind of basic service, as you well know, is pretty much supported through local investment. But we also know that future funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will be tied to benchmarks in some way. So if you haven't heard, let us be the ones to tell you, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will no longer be in the business of the kinds of projects they've been in the business of, of providing to libraries in the past. In other words, the projects we've come to know and love them for, um, the assistance they've given us in upgrading our computers, that will not be their focus any longer. They will be somehow focusing on providing support to libraries to meet and exceed benchmarks. We don't know much about that, we just know that this is, this is going to be somehow related. So what they have, what the people who have been working on these benchmarks imagine is, they want us to use our imagination to visualize how we might use the benchmarks to create a dialogue with a local opinion leader that helps to frame the issue something like this. If we can do fill in the blank, something we've been doing in our library with the recess sources we have now, we could do fill in the blank, something we haven't done yet, with these kinds of additional resources. So it helps us to actually stretch the imagination of our community beyond the library we have now and the services we provide now to the library of the future. Hopefully that's what it'll do. That's our hope is that that'll help us get that conversation going. Okay, what will benchmarks be like? Well, that's a good question. Um, the, the group that's working on this say they will be aspirational that they will help us to aspire to that library of the future. They will not be status quo. They will set a high standard for quality and be motivational and encourage us to achieve excellence or to shoot for excellence. They also say the benchmarks will be designed to help all libraries regardless of size. And that's very important to us and we've tried to make that point whenever we've met with any group that's talked about these benchmarks that we believe that they need to understand the needs of smaller libraries that yes we need aspirational goals to stretch to but the benchmarks have to be set up so they are reasonable for depending on what kind of resources you have in your community for library service. So they're attainable for attainable. The, uh, the, the smallest library out there. Yeah so they have to be scalable. Mm -hmm. That's right. They have to recognize achievements and provide a path for continuous improvement. So we need to recognize what you're doing now and how far you've come but see the path that you might need to follow in order to continually improve and achieve. Um, they'll be constantly changing the bar. And that, I think, is something we know now is, is really the way the world works. It's like, it used to be, I remember the day in my work life where I could set a standard or set a goal and achieve the goal and think, I did it. I'm done. But, you know, you never really are. We're constantly changing the bar and looking to the next step because things are always changing. So the benchmarks will evolve to reflect emerging technologies, behaviors, opportunities, and standards of library practice. The benchmarks will focus on the actual use of technology. This is really, really important to me because mm -hmm. I have for years been talking about we in libraries are not interested in technology for technology's sake. We, that's never been our interest. Uh, the book was fine technology, but it's not technology for technology's sake. It is for, we want to focus on the actual uses of technology and how they help our customers achieve their goals and, and their successes. So benchmarks will focus on the actual uses of technology. For example, education, workforce development, access to court and legal information, access to health information, access to information to help people start small businesses. This is what we're interested in. Not technology for technology's sake, but how technology helps our customers. So the use of these benchmarks should provide clear value for your library leaders and your local leaders. So I guess I have a few final thoughts that I want to share about benchmarks, and then I would like if I could have a few more minutes 
to update you on what's been happening since the last time I took a look at this, which was in August when we had our technology planning session. Um, first of all, one thing to remember, benchmarks are voluntary. Nobody has to use them that doesn't want to use them. And the group that's working on this knows that. So they know they need to develop something that's going to be useful for all of you. So you'll want to use them and they'll make sense to you and they'll help you in your community. Um, and what they'll help you do is communicate your strengths and your needs. For a long time in uh, public library marketing, but also in other kind of library service marketing, we've been talking about the fact that we're we know people love us. We know we're lovable. We know we do wonderful things, and we know we have strengths. But we also have to talk about, with our, our lovers, all the people who love us, we need to talk about what we need. So I always say to people, if you tell me you love the library, then tell somebody else you love the library. We need your support. We need you to advocate for us. So if you love the library, tell a friend you love the library. If you love the library story time, bring a friend to library story time with their child. I mean, these are the kinds of things that, that we need in public libraries, and we need to communicate our needs as well as what, how, what we do well and our strengths. Third point, Gates funding and possibly other funding is likely to be tied to benchmarks in the future. We don't know how. We don't know where this is going. We just know that a lot of attention and interest has been put to this, and we could see how Having that kind of dialogue we talked about before, if we have this, if we're doing this great thing with what we have, what could we do if we had this? That sounds like the kind of thing that would be a great story to tell when you want funding. Um, the, ben the benchmarks process, it, we're in process in the development of these benchmarks. The input gathering period is through March 2012, and in a minute we'll get into how you can provide some input. In April 2012, Strategies will be implemented to encourage widespread adoption of benchmarks, whatever that means. I'm not <laughs> sure what those strategies are, but April 2012 is when the benchmarks will go into effect and there will be some encouragement for all of you to adopt these benchmarks in, in any way that they work for you in your community. So I guess if you have questions about this, if you have ideas, if you have thoughts, if you'd like to share um, ideas with me, I would encourage you to get a hold of me, or I would encourage you to go to the Library Commission blog and share in a way that other people can see what you're sharing. Now, I'm going to go to our blog here, and sometimes in these uh, broadcasts, when we are in between websites, we lose the audio. So I'm going to try. It's going to be hard. I'm trying not to talk while we're doing this until we get to the website. So by the way, if you have any questions or suggestions right now, please type them on in share. or share yep. them uh, in any way. If you'd like to speak into your microphone, we'd love to have that dialogue. So go ahead and tell Krista to unmute you. Okay, here we are at the, the Library Commission homepage. For those of you who aren't familiar with our website, we, it's got a beautiful new look and, a, and an amazingly functional set up and design, so I'm hoping that all of you are trying it out and using it and enjoying using it. And if you want to see blog posts beyond the ones that are on the front page, you go down here to the bottom and you click on more blog posts. Okay, we're here now so I can talk. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to search this blog and we're going to look for benchmarks and see what kind of discussion has gone on about benchmarks since the conversation at the Technology Planning. Okay, here we are. This is a benchmarks post that I put up right after the Technology Planning session. And this post has some of the information that I've been talking about, but then if you go to the bottom of the post, you notice there are two comments. So I'm going to click on them. Okay, There's, these are the two comments. Linda Reisinger, um, and I will just read her comment. She basically says, benchmarks for continued funding are understandable. However, if they are made too stringent, small libraries can't, consist, can't constantly up the ante because of very limited local funding. 
limited space, and very small stats may be left out in the cold. It seems to me that the small, or should I say tiny, and I think that's a really good point that Linda makes there, mm -hmm. is that sometimes when some of these groups, uh, national groups, are talking about small, they're really talking about libraries that we consider pretty big in our, in, in our community, mm -hmm. in our state. Uh, or should I say tiny? See, where is she? Libraries are serving a very important technology purpose in their communities, and if they aren't able to meet ever escalating benchmarks, they may be hurt rather than helped by this plan. Let's not forget about smaller populations served by these small libraries and the desire for better, bigger, more for the bigger populations. Just a thought to keep in mind as this plan goes forward. I think this is a really good comment from Linda, and I'm hoping, Linda, if you're out there, that you'll share this comment, um, and I'll show you here at the bottom of this page how to do that. I'm going to scroll down. This is my reply. Now, in my reply, I want to encourage Linda, but all of you, to take a look at te the TechSoup article that's behind this link. Um, it's called Creating Meaningful and Useful Public Access Technology Benchmarks. And it addresses some of the points that Linda brings up and shares some reactions of other librarians. Um, I'm going to see if I can go there. Okay, we're here. And some of the librarians, some of the reactions include, uh, one of the things that they said, I'm going to just point out here, this perspective, and this is very similar to the perspective of Linda's comment, this perspective gets right to the belly of the beast. A benchmark amplifies and raises standards and sometimes that's a difficult pill to swallow. So we want to make sure that benchmarks have room for libraries that are working towards these benchmarks and so that they aren't in the belly of the beast, but instead working on slaying the beast. Um, this person says if the vision is achieved, it will give us a technology planning tool and help us tell the story. That's kind of what I thought. When I first heard about this, that was my first reaction, exactly. I looked at it and I thought, I see this as a potential tool for better storytelling, for getting the right story out there and one that people understand. Because don't you think sometimes it is hard to imagine what the library of the future is going to be like? Look how much everything's changed in the last couple of years. I mean, obviously, we have to be changing all the time to stay with the future. Um, another point that's made here, I think, is a great good. Talking point about what you hit that oh point. yeah, Richard. Years. Richard said um, to be sure and point out that this could create great talking points for board members to bring to city council meetings. Mm -hmm. If we have this kind of a dialogue in the city council meetings every couple of months, they would begin to stretch their imaginations as to what the library could do for the community. Um, and again, this is a similar comment. Please give us pointers on how to use benchmarks with one local leader in the political realm. Start with one. If you can't go to the city council meeting, start with one. Um, help us communicate to the general public because they influence the decision makers, especially your opinion leaders in your community, of course. I thought this was great. Best thing that could come from this, an easy one-page document I can share with my overworked city managers. <laughs> Again, here's the list of the, the people who are working on this, and they then at the bottom of this tech soup ask us to complete a two-question survey to let them know what we think about this. So if you go back to this post that I've got the comment on, um, I say down here that there is this two-question survey at this link, and all of us are invited to fill this out, and it really is just two questions. Is there any mission, is there anything missing from the vision or guiding principles? What strikes you about the Benchmarks initiative? Is it exciting? Is it useful? I mean, seriously, that's all that you have to do is fill this out. And I think they need to really get some, some thoughtful comments from people who are in small or, like Linda said, tiny libraries. It's so. nice that the survey isn't what you expect of a survey of pre-written questions where they're giving you, well, just pick the answers we think we want you to say. Yeah. It's just two totally wide open, empty boxes, fill into your heart's content exactly what you want to say to them. <laughs> That's right. And, and actually, Krista, 
something like Linda wrote in that comment mm -hmm. would yeah. be perfect to just put in that second box. She needs to copy and paste it into there. <laughs> she needs to copy and paste it in there. They need to hear from us because they will hear from others, and mm -hmm. the local libraries in Nebraska have got something to say. So if I could just go back here, if I can do it, actually, um, okay. Back to the blog post and remind people, you just go to our blog, search the blog for benchmarks to find this. Do you have any questions? Or if anybody has any questions, type them in your question section there. If you want me to unmute your microphone, tell me that, and I'll do that, and you can ask your question that way. Doesn't look like anything ur urgent is coming in, but if you do, I'm, I'm monitoring, so if you do something pops into your head, feel free. And I'm very joking to answer your question any time. Um, I'll just minimize this down and switch us over to Ta-da! And now Richard Miller. Now Richard's in charge. <laughs> um, so now we're going to switch over to Richard. He's going to talk to us all about sinking funds. So we can all right. not have our library boat sink. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We'll talk about, about boats and piggy banks and all kinds of good things here. Well, as I did during the summer camp, I want to begin with two apologies. First of all, I am apologizing to Jessica Chamberlain, who's director of the Northeast Library System, because I promised her an article on sinking funds months and months ago. And it turns out that when I finally did the research, and I've been talking about sinking funds for years. If you've ever heard me speak, I talk about it and say, maybe you should have one of these. Um, when I finally got into the state statutes, I found out that uh, it's a bit more complicated than I thought. However... We'll try to clarify some of those complications today and answer your questions and see if you do have questions. I'm also, however, apologizing to you because I'm going to be reading to you from state statutes, which if any of you have read state statutes on a regular basis, you know that they're pretty dry. They're a good thing to put by your bedstand at night. If you'd like to read them, they'll put you right to sleep. <laughs> and that's what we'll be talking to you today about whether sinking funds, what they are, whether they are for your library. I'm going to begin with the definition from section 13-518, subsection 5, where it talks about sinking funds, which it says means that they are funds maintained separately from the general fund to pay for acquisition or replacement of tangible personal property with a useful life of five years or more. And basically it says that those expenditures may occur in the future, but you can add money to a piggy bank, as it were, before that actually happens. When you look further into the state statutes, in the state uh, statutes there's something they call special reserve fund, which is a, a larger term uh, that is used to cover different types of sinking funds. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on the two different kinds of sinking funds that are uh, laid out in the state statutes. The two types are voter approved sinking funds and statutorily authorized sinking funds. It's that second one that we're going to spend a little bit more time on because I think that has more promise for folks. And we'll be distinguishing between these two types as we talk about it. The only graphic I have in here is a cute little pink piggy bank. <laughs> and I think you can think about sinking funds as kind of a piggy bank. Um, and the, the whole idea of sinking funds is not that difficult a concept to understand, but I think this is a good graphic to help understand it. Just as the example I used during the summer camp was, if you buy a car, the moment you drive it off the lot, the value of that car sinks. In fact, it sinks quite rapidly. For those of you who have bought cars, you understand this. <laughs> so just as with cars, with computers, the value of that asset or that computer sinks over time. And the idea of a sinking fund is that as the value of that asset sinks, you're setting aside money that rises over the time, and when they come to the end of that graphic, whether it's three years or five years, depending upon your replacement schedule for your computers, and I know some of you have computers a lot older than that, you probably shouldn't, but when it comes to the end of life for those assets, then you have saved money in the meantime uh, to replace that asset. So what is a sinking fund good for? Well, as I pointed out already, it's good for replacing computer equipment, but it can also be used for other big-ticket capital items, like uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, like saving money for a new building or a renovation or an addition of your building. Whatever other large capital costs you can think of, 
a sinking fund might be a handy way to, uh, to save money for that purpose. Another major advantage of a sinking fund is that, as I understand it, and you may need to talk to your local attorney about this, Section 13-520 says that the section that has to do with sinking funds means that those sinking funds are outside the restrictions that we have in our state statutes for the taxing and spending lid. Now the theory of sinking funds are that everybody knows that there are capital costs when you're running a library that are outside the operations costs. There's money you have to set aside or money you have to have to replace capital assets that you probably can't get out of your operating budget. It's just an impossible sort of thing. So this is a way that the state statutes in Nebraska have set up to try to set aside money and save money in your piggy bank for when you actually need to replace that capital asset. And the advantage of having it outside the taxing and spending lid is, of course, if you know anything about the state taxing and spending lids, they're pretty darn restrictive. Uh, they keep under control how much taxes can be raised. They keep under control how much local entities, public entities, can spend. So this is a real advantage of a sinking fund that you should be considering. So who may establish a sinking fund? Well, here we go to Chapter 51, 51-209, which is the, the library section of the state statutes. If you haven't read Chapter 51, you should be familiar with it, if you're a public library. And in Chapter, in uh, Section 51-209, it says that the city, village, county, or township may establish a public library sinking fund for major capital expenditures. That's not your library board, even if it is a governing library board, that is your city or village or county governing elected officials. So where do the funds come from to put into the sinking fund? Well, according to state statutes, those funds can come from donations, such as donations of property, donations of real estate, a bequest, or otherwise. They also may come from a tax levy of not more than 10 and a half cents per hundred dollars of assessed valuation on property which tax levy can be collected for up to 10 years. So the sinking fund can have donated materials and assets in it but it can also have money that is generated from a tax levy. And As I explained before this tax levy can be levied or done on local property for the years prior to the point that you have to replace that capital asset. So how's a sinking fund established? Well, we have to go back to the two different types of sinking funds that I talked about before. There's the voter approved sinking fund, and that has to do, uh, that means that it has to go to a vote of the people in order to establish uh, a levy of up to 10.5 cents per $100 of valuation that can go into that sinking fund. Or there is the statutorily authorized sinking fund. And I don't mean to use fancy language, but basically statutorily authorized sinking fund means that it is approved in state statute, and it also means without a vote of the people. That's the one I really want to concentrate on here. We also noted that assets consisting of either donated assets or assets from a tax levy can go into the sinking fund. I think also there can be a mix of those, but again, you would want to talk to your local attorney to clarify that. Voter-approved sinking funds require a vote of the people with all the steps necessary for that process. Anytime you have a vote of the people, it's serious business. So you have to be very clear working with your local clerk, working with your local attorney, that any kind of voting language that you put together is approved and clear and cleared by your uh, attorney because it's a very careful and could be dangerous process if you don't follow the rules carefully. So that's pretty clear about voter approved sinking funds. But what about the statutorily authorized sinking funds? That is one authorized by state law, one not requiring a vote of the people, where no tax monies are involved. And here's where it gets kind of sticky, and that's why I was apologizing earlier on about having to read state statutes. Even having to interpret this is an even stickier issue. 
and it is ambiguous. Um, I've talked to two attorneys about this. The first attorney I talked to said, you need to talk to somebody who has got uh, experience with state statutes that have to do with local government entities. So I called Gary Crumland, who is the assistant director of the League of Nebraska Municipalities and an attorney. And he spoke to me about the ambiguity in the law. Um, I had, I felt kind of fortunate about this. I guess I read the law often enough that I had found the appropriate sections of the state statute. So I just needed his expertise to help uh, interpret those. This is what Gary said. He said that that section 19-1301, which says that villages and cities can receive donated money or property for the benefit of any one or more of the public purposes for which sinking funds are established. Unfortunately, it does not explain how to establish such a fund or even whether such a fund must be established. And in section 13503, which distinguishes between those two types of sinking funds, that's the section on which we're going to hang our hats here. According to Gary, this 1913-01 is ambiguous and will only be cleared up through legislation, so we're not going to worry too much about that. Section 13-5039, uh, which seems to allow a sinking fund either by a vote of the people or by resolution of the village, city, or county board, and that means statutorily established, is open to interpretation of the local city or village attorney. So basically what he said was, is that this 13503 subsection 9, which has to do with statutorily authorized sinking fund, the answer is, it depends. And it depends <laughs> on your local city or village attorney to see if she or he is comfortable with recommending to the village or city board the establishment of a sinking fund. And the reason I say if they're comfortable with recommending it, they have to be comfortable with it. And they have to encourage and assure the village or county or city board that they are comfortable with it and they can establish a sinking fund by a resolution of that governing body as opposed to going to a vote of the people. And I would assume one question you want to ask is, do we have any other sinking funds in the community? Because if they already yes. have one for replacing the fire truck or something, then right. wouldn't they just follow that model? They certainly could. Yeah. They may already certainly have might. something you just don't know it at the library. Right, right. yeah. And the city council or village board or county board also has to decide whether that sinking fund could contain donations or tax revenues or a mix of two, a mix of both of them. Now, there is another question that I think you'd have to ask your city attorney, which I don't have portrayed up on the screen here, and that is that if, for example, at the end of a fiscal year, you have money left over in the library budget, and I hope not many of you have that. I hope you fully expend the money that you have uh, assigned to the library. For the most part, that's a good idea, because if you always land up with money left over, the city will probably say, well, they don't need that much money for the following year. But if there is money left over, either in the library budget or perhaps even elsewhere in the budget, it would be interesting to ask your city attorney or county attorney if some of that money could be put into a sinking fund. So that's another one to ask. Now, if you have any questions about this, uh, please ask them now. I am going to talk to you about one other possible source of funding that you might consider if you haven't of legislation that was passed several years ago, and no one I know has used this so far, but uh, there is one more graphic on here, as you see. I hope you will take a hammer to that piggy bank and use this uh, for replacing your computers or replacing other things that you need to. We deliberately brought that up during the summer camp because we were really talking about replacement of computers. And again, as we said during several sessions of the summer camp, if you're not now viewing the regular replacement of your technology on a regular basis, you really should. It's part of the cost of doing business of public libraries, and you really have to build that into your budgets. You really have to establish sinking funds if that's what you need. The ideal, of course, would be to have replacement costs built into your operating budget, 
the sinking fund might be a way of easing into this if you don't currently have enough in your operating budget for regular replacement of your technology, which really does need to be replaced on a regular basis. Do we have any questions that have come in yet? Um, no, not yet. Anybody have any questions? Anything um, that you didn't understand in all those wonderful statutes <laughs> that you want that Richard could elaborate on? Or any questions you have about anything he talked about? Can you type them into your questions section in your interface and I can pass them on. Or if you have any questions from Mary Jo about what she spoke about earlier, you can ask that now as well. Or contact me afterward either on my oh, yes. email or 800 number. Just or give us a call. Yeah. Or Mary Jo. Well, the last thing I'm going to talk about is another set of statutes, which I know you're just thrilled about. And I want to cite them to you because I don't have a graphic on this. But if you want to look at this, take down a note about the sections of the state statutes I'm talking about. They are section 72-2301 through 72-2307. Now, are, are these statutes are online on the state yes. website. Okay. When we put up the recording for the session, we'll also link to where these are on the state's website as well. Thank you, Kristen. It's a great idea. This section of the state statutes is called Public Facilities Construction and Finance Act. And when Mike Nolan was up at, uh, as city manager at Norfolk and Ted Smith was the librarian up there, they are the ones who really pushed this through the state legislature. This act um, and these sections of the state statutes allow local governmental units which cooperate with other governmental units to issue bonds to finance joint projects which may be serviced by project uh, by uh, pro property taxes. What this is in layman's language it says that if you are going to do uh, if you're going to do a technology project where let's say you're going to have a shared circulation system, if you're working with another governmental entity that is outside your city, outside your village, outside your county, and you want to do that jointly, you can actually use this section of the state statutes to get some additional funding. And this, just as the sinking funds, even though it is using state, or even though it is using local funds, that is property taxes, is outside the taxing and spending lids. It was sold to the state legislature and they bought this concept because it is talking about necessary capital assets that public libraries as well as other public entities need to function. <clears throat> These statutes do not relate just to public libraries, but public libraries are built into them. There's a section under 72-2303 where it says that the purpose of the Public Facilities Construction and Finance Act, uh, I'm sorry, a joint project means a project financed and operated by at least two or more qualified public agencies cooperating as a joint entity or joint public agency for any item of hardware or software used in providing for the delivery of information, including the purchasing, of upgrades or related improvements to information technology for the operation of libraries operated by counties, municipalities, school districts, educational service units, and community colleges. So it could be a cooperative project between a public library and a community college library, for yes, example. Yes, it certainly yeah, could. Interesting. It certainly could. It really opens up a lot of opportunities. Under Section 72-2304, bonds are authorized for this purpose because that's the way this money is generated. Bonds are sold. And those bonds generate, uh, the interest of course has to be paid on them, but those bonds generate money for this particular purpose. And under section, that same section 72-2304, it says under subsection 3, no election shall be required prior to the issuance of bonds. Now what you have to do before you do bonds are you have to collect a certain number of signatures. This depends on the size of your community or the size of your county. And built into that section of the legislature, a uh, section of the statutes, it will tell you that, for example, for cities of the metropolitan class, you have to have 1,500 signatures of registered voters. Doesn't sound like very many for a city Not of the for metropolitan metro, class. Which is Omaha only. For primary class, which would be Lincoln, it would be 1,000 signatures. For cities of the first class, 750 signatures, and so on down the line. For, for villages, it's 50 signatures. For counties, 
Uh, it depends on the size of the class of county, which range from class one for 50 signatures up through class seven counties, uh, 1,500 signatures. Under 72-2306, it talks about information technology for libraries, for bonds, and the amount authorized. The amount authorized is different depending upon the size of your community. For um, metropolitan and primary classes, which would be only Lincoln and Omaha, they can issue bonds for up to 250000 For cities of the first class, for school districts, ESUs, and community colleges, they can issue bonds for up to 100000 And for cities of the second class and villages, they can issue bonds of up to 50000 and again, in the last section, 72-2307, it says, taxes levied, meaning the bonds, for such purposes shall not be subject to the limitations in section 77-3442, which is the taxing and spending limits. However, in counties, it does say the levying of taxes to pay such bonds for any county shall be subject to the constitutional limitation upon levying taxes by a county. So that's a little bit different for counties. Please let me know if you've got any questions about this. I realize it's really pretty technical, but you should have your city attorney or village attorney or county attorney look into this if this looks like something you'd like to, to do. And it is yet another source, possible source for replacement of, of uh, technology within your libraries. Yeah, they'll love to read that stuff. That's what they oh, do. yeah. <laughs> they get paid to read that stuff. We're not paid big enough bucks to read this stuff. I don't know why I do it. <laughs> So any questions at this time? Nobody's typed in anything yet. Well, I just want to uh, reiterate that when it comes to benchmarks, they still need our input. Mm -hmm. And so I would really encourage you to take a look at that blog post that has a link to that two-question questionnaire survey and make your feelings known. Mm -hmm. Get your voice in there so it's included. Well, it doesn't look like anybody has any urgent questions at the moment. You guys either ex explained everything perfectly or they're stunned. <laughs> Maybe everybody's and, asleep after those statutes. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. You have their contact information for both Richard and Mary Jo. Of course, you guys know where to find them. So if you have any questions, as you, you know, as you do start thinking about this, about either of these topics that they talked about today, give them a call, send them an email, and they can help you out with that. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for attending today's Encompass Live. Um, I think it was definitely very useful and great to have all this information out there, again, repeated beyond just the people that were able to come to our um, tech planning summer camps. Um, and thank you, Krista, yeah. for setting us up yeah, and yeah. keeping us on the air. <laughs> no problem. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live, since we don't have any questions coming in at the moment. Um, I hope you'll join us next time, which will not be next week, because next week is our <clears throat> annual NLA NEMA um, annual conference um, being held here in Lincoln. So um, we always take that week off um, during the year. So um, enjoy, go to the conference, enjoy that. We're come sure visit us in the yeah. exhibit area. We'd like to meet you face to face. Yeah, come to the booth and ask some questions. <laughs> Krista, could I mention one other sure. thing? It's kind of interesting also. This week, the League of Nebraska Municipalities okay. is meeting at its annual meeting also at the Cornhusker right across the bridge from where we are here. And we will have both NLA and the Commission and the systems will have actually two exhibits this time. And we will be talking to them about the VTOP libraries. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking to them about uh, uh, e-books and good stuff over there. And NLA will be talking to them about accreditation and so forth. So. Mm -hmm. This is why we hope this is the kind of thing that we need to do on the state level and you need to do on the local level, getting in touch with your local officials, which Mary Jo talked to you about and I've talked to you about as well. Yeah, it's very they important meetings to do. Yeah, meetings or events like this too, go there and yes. watch them on now. Um, we do have one comment. Um, Terry Wingate, who's from Omaha Public, says, thanks, I'll pass this along to my director. All right. So, Thank Mary, you. you're looking for that. <laughs> Um, so as I said, next week we will take we take the week off, so um, we will not see you next week. But the week after that, um, on October 12th, that's when we come back, um, our, ses our session will be on um, Nebraska Library Commission supporting education for librarians, where um, Laura Johnson and Catherine Brockmeyer, both here from the Library Commission, are going to talk about the Commission's scholarship program and the continuing education and training grants for 2012. So ways for librarians to get um, educated and to um, do their professional development and um, get training and advance in their careers. 
So I hope you'll join us in two weeks for the next Encompass Live then. So it looks like there's nothing last coming in. I think we will uh, wrap it up and say goodbye. And thank you very much to attending for attending. Bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See you next time.